So uh, my name is Marshall Clow. I, uh, I work at Qualcomm on uh, Boost and LLVM mostly. Um, I have a, a, a blog which I post whenever inspiration strikes, which seems to be on the order of four or five times a year. Um, um, you can follow me on Twitter. It's, I have an email address. Idio.com is, uh, is my domain. I tell everybody it's like idiot, only without the T, which goes with my last name, which is clown without the N. Um, and, uh, and I'm on the, uh, the, the boost lists under, or actually a Gmail account that I use to manage lists. It's mcloud.lists at gmail.com. So that's, if you see me on the boost list, if you see that address on the boost list, that's me too. Okay. So we're going to start off this talk by putting you all to sleep. I throw up, you know, a bunch of lines from the C++ standard. And, uh, and basically... The key part here is undefined behavior is behavior for which this international standard imposes no requirements. So no requirements. Um, that's the key. Um, there's, there's no limitations on what could happen. Um, examples of what could happen. OK? Your program could crash. OK? My feeling is that, that this is one of the best things that could happen. <laughs> OK? Um, your program could give unexpected results. I'm not going to say wrong answers, because there are no wrong answers in undefined behavior. OK? There's any particular result is every bit as correct as any other result. Um, so giving unexpected results, you know, not wrong answers, but your computer could catch fire. Um, your cat could get pregnant. Um, this would be really disconcerting for me because I don't have a cat. Um, <laughs> so if my cat gets pregnant, that's big news. Um, the C committee has this ongoing joke, which it said bas basically started off with undefined behavior could cause demons to fly out of my nose. Um, and now, th now they've, they've formalized it to invoking the nasal demons. <laughs> um, and frankly, the scariest one, uh, it, a result of undefined behavior, is this one. Your program can appear to work fine. And it can work fine. It gives answers that you expect. It does what you expect on this run, on the next run, on your run on Monday, and on Tuesday it does something different. If you're unlucky, it does something different three years after you ship it. Yes. Or when you, when you upgrade to a new version of the compiler. Um, right? Or you decide that you're going to optimize for size instead of performance. And suddenly it gives you the different answers. Um, anyway, the key to, to remember about undefined behavior is no wrong answers. There are no wrong answers with undefined behavior. There's no incorrect behavior for your program. And we'll start off with a simple example. OK? We have an array, right? We have an int. We have an expression here, OK? We're modifying the variable i twice within the same expression. I mean, we can talk about sequence points and things like that. But this is undefined behavior, You're modifying a variable twice in a single expression. What should get printed here? Well. That the answer is uh, there's no wrong answers here. Printing nothing is, is perfectly reasonable. Reformatting your hard disk. Um, more prosaically, GCC will print 10. Clang will print 9 under some circumstances. Okay, I didn't try you know, varying the optimization level or trying different versions of these and so on. But you can see you know, th neither of these are wrong. And somebody has actually tried this with ICC and discovered that ICC prints 11. Um, and the, the, the thing is, is that it all depends on the order of these operations. And addition is commutative, right? <laughs> yes? Neither is, neither is wrong. Right, exactly. There are no wrong answers. Right. No. Yeah, none of the, neither of the, 
for me, neither of them is okay. Um, because, uh, as you say, tomorrow the song could be another. We have in the, in the communist the songs. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. Right. I mean, this, this, this is, you know, syntactically, this is a well-formed program. But semantically, this is a program that exhibits undefined behavior, and so you, you, you have no guarantees about the result. I saw your hand first, and your second. Okay, so I wonder whether printing nothing is actually possible, because the undefined behavior is, of course, in the evaluation of the addition, but the expression still has to be some kind of integer. Um, no, but if you hang on to that, I have, I think I have some compelling examples later to see why that, why uh, that's not a correct assumption. Um, undefined behavior means, means undefined behavior. There isn't, there are, you know, back here, no requirements, imposes no requirements. There's nothing that says that, that this program actually has to terminate. It has to, it has to it, because it exhibits undefined behavior, um, it doesn't have to terminate. It doesn't have to print anything. It doesn't have to do anything. Dan? Can a compiler or static analysis protect that and flag it? Um, this example, I believe that a static analysis tool or a compiler could, in fact, check. Um, but many ex examples, oh, sorry. Um, the, the question was, could a compiler or static analysis tool um, find undefined behavior and flag it? And this example, yes, certainly could. I mean, we, we can look at this and inspect this and say, yeah, it really doesn't matter what I starts out as. This is going to be undefined behavior pretty much every time you, you run it. Um, I'll show you some examples in a little while where that's really not true. There was another hand over here. I saw, yes. I guess, you know, kind of what he, uh, in reference to what he was saying, I think the whole, the undefined behavior applies to like the whole program is undefined even above the point where you have the behavior itself. Right. The, co the comment was that the undefined behavior does, does not actually just apply to this expression. It applies to the program as a whole. The program exhibits undefined behavior. Um, and that's correct. Um, any other comments on this? So, yes, Ed. so you're saying that <clears throat> I have this huge program and I've got one line of undefined behavior in one DLL and to bury down in the code, that that means that the program is undefined as an entirety? Um, if, if that routine gets called, if that code gets executed, then the behavior of the entire program is, is not, okay, the question, the question was is if, if you have a routine that has some undefined behavior in it buried in some DLL that you call, does that mean that your entire program is undefined? And, and the answer is, if you call that routine as part of the execution flow of your program, then the result of running your program, the, the behavior of your program is undefined. Yeah, that's your answer to that. I was gonna say okay, that. yes. Could we say that until the moment that you encounter an expression or an evaluation which produces undefined behavior, until that moment, your program is in well-defined territory. Okay. Question is, can we say that until your program ex execute, encounters a, a piece here that uh, exhibits undefined behavior, that the behavior of a program is undefined? Sadly, no. But if you'll hang on to that, I'll show you why. Um, maybe 10 slides in. It has to do with compiler optimizations. Um, okay. So how can you get undefined behavior? Um, I've got a, a whole laundry list here. I actually got three slides here. Um, signed integer overflow is probably the most common. Um, interestingly enough, unsigned integers, there's a special call out in, uh, in the standard that says that unsigned integers basically have to act like two's complement integers. They, they wrap modulo the maximum unsigned value. But unsigned integers, this is not true. And a lot of this is because C, and this came from C, um, C ran on systems, C runs on systems where signed integer overflow could cause a trap. Okay? The standard's not going to say anything about trap instructions or anything like that. Um, 
standard doesn't say anything about memory protection either. Um, so that, you know, that is behavior outside the standard. That's behavior that the standard places no restrictions on. Signed integer overflow. Um, we'll see, I have several examples of signed integer overflow because it's probably the most common. Um, dereferencing a null pointer or the result of malloc zero. You know, if you call malloc with a size of zero, you get back a valid pointer. Okay, you can test to see if the allocation succeeded. You can pass it to free. You can pass it to realloc to make it bigger. But you can't indirect through it because there's nothing there. Um, it, most modern machines have memory protection. If you try to dereference um, a, a null pointer, what happens? You get a bus error, a protection violation, or something, and your program is now lying on the floor with a bullet in its head. Um, that's behavior outside the scope of the standard. That's a very helpful behavior, but that's something that the standard doesn't specify, and that counts as undefined behavior. That's, that's a nice thing that happens. Remember what I said? Um, example, program crashes. It's a really good thing. If you're running on, um, I used to write Mac software in pre-Mac OS 10 days, um, and there was no memory protection. And so people read from location zero. It was just a pointer, and, then, and there was data there. Um, it was almost always a bug, but it didn't actually. Well, you read from location zero, you got a value. It wasn't what you expected. Yes? Malloc zero any different from say malloc ten, and then you reference beyond the end of your. It's really the same thing. It's really the same thing. Um, it, the question was: Is malloc zero anything, and dereferencing it, uh, actually different from say malloc ten, and then allocating the tenth element of that? No, not really. Um, but it's an example of a pointer you just can't dereference at all. Um, shift, shift left, shift right. By, uh, by an amount that's greater than or equal to the width of the operand. Um, if you have a 32-bit integer and you shift left 32 bits, you don't get zero, you get undefined behavior. I mean, a lot of hardware will give you a zero. They'll just say all those bits, they get thrown off the end and get replaced by zeros. Um, one of the really hard things about undefined behavior if, especially if you've been programming for a while, is you have this mental model in your head of how the hardware works, right? Signed integer overflow. You two, add two big numbers, you get a number back because that's how the add instruction on, say, x86 works, right? You have to let that go, <laughs> okay? Because, because C has this... Um, C and C, uh, sorry, C++ has this idea of how this kind of abstract machine works and then maps that to whatever you're running on. And it's, a, it's, it's not a big machine. It's not, you know, it's not a whole virtual machine like Java or anything. But you hear talk about the C++ memory model and so on. And, um, and that's, you know, that's the context in which the compiler generates code for and then maps it to the underlying hardware. And some of the things, like signed integer overflow, they, you know, the result of adding two numbers that would cause an overflow for integers vary from actual physical hardware to physical hardware. And so in the, the C++ abstract machine, um, this is an undefined behavior. Um, reading from uninitialized variables. Just, I mean, you know, undefined behavior, OK? If you're lucky, you'll just get random values. But um, we'll talk about compiler optimizations later. Modifying variable more than once in an expression. Um, buffer overflow. Reading or writing past the end of a buffer. Okay, that's different from reading or writing un uninitialized variables, uninitialized memory. Because, you know, if you run off the end of a global buffer and you read or you write there, that may not, that's probably not uninitialized. It's just a different variable. Um, comparing pointers into two different data structures. Um, yeah, you say, what? I can compare pointers. You know, it's just a compare instruction. Again, you know, comparing pointers doesn't really make any sense if they're different data structures. Okay, you have an array. You can compare something in the array to the start of the array or one past the end. Actually, there's a special call out for one past the end. Just like iterators in, 
you know, in fact, you can you can form an iterator to one past the end. You can't dereference it, but you can you can manipulate it. Um, you can't compare iterators from two different data structures, right? Same thing with pointers. Um, pointer overflow. If you increment a pointer to the point where its underlying representation overflows, um, modifying a const object in C++, and or or a string literal, because string literals are const scarcer. <coughs> My compiler won't compile that. Won't co compile won't what? Won't compile it modifying a const object. I mean, the co const, oh my god. I mean, if I use const, I don't want to have undefined behavior. I want it to warn me when I modify it. Um, and, and if you do it directly, so the question, the, com the comment, Ed's comment was, if I have a, a const object and I modify it, the compiler complains about it. Yeah. And that's, that's absolutely true, okay, if you do it directly. But suppose I have a pointer to a con, I have a f const foo, and somehow I end up with a pointer to a non-const foo that points at this thing. Now I can modify it, and the compiler has no way to know. Question in the back. Um, so the question is, it, is it impossible then to check and see if a pointer is within the bounds of a C array? Um, I, I, it's possible to check, and if it is, if it is in the bounds, it's okay. And if it's not in the bounds, it's yeah, okay. That, <laughs> John, John said, yeah, well, certainly you can check. You can write code that checks, but I think John's right, that if, if it's not in the bounds, you've in, invoked undefined behavior. Question in the back. For that one, could you use std less for the pointer? std less de is defined to be, is defined. Uh, well, except that, one. except that what, the question is, could you use std less? And you can use std less, but it won't tell you what he wants, which is with it, is it within a, within a data structure? Because it's, um, it doesn't just tell you which point, pointer is greater. You could do that. Yeah. You could you can compare that way. Um, hmm. I have to think about that. I have to think about that. Yes. Suppose suppose I've done a collection of malloc's uh -huh. and gotten pointers back from those. Right. They're not in the same data stream. Right. Am I allowed to order those by comparison, or is that undefined behavior? I'm, what I would expect is that the ordering would vary from machine to machine. And run to run. Okay, the question was, it's suppose I have a collection of pointers that I've got by multiple calls to malloc. Am I allowed to order those pointers? And it, and it is, obviously, they're going to vary. The, the pointers are going to, the order is going to vary from machine to machine, from run to run, from what else is going on in your program at any given time, because basically, um, the the sequence that you get back from malloc is non-deterministic. Um, hmm. You know what? I I'll, I'll go back and look into this some more. Okay. You can't. What? You can't. You can't. You can't compare them. You can't order them. No, they're separate. Data. Okay. Well, that's what less is for. You can less. Michael Michael has said that 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 you can't do this with greater with, than or less than. Okay. With greater than or less than. Um, John has said that STD less will do this. I, I'm going to say that so I'm going to go look at this some more. <laughs> Chiang? About, uh, uh, about the comparing pointers, uh -huh. I think that has something to do with strict aliasing. Um, so I believe if you have two compatible uh, online types, you can actually. OK, Chiang says that, uh, that this, this is uh, this ties into strict aliasing rules and that if you have uh, two pointers to, I'm sorry, you said unaligned, similarly aligned types? Uh, compatible, uh, Com compatible size types? No, uh, oh. it's very rare uh, uh, rule and different things. Okay. Okay, well let's, let's go on with this because um, and, and if we have time, we'll come back to it and we can discuss it. Yes? I've been wondering whether the
const is a new thing because I re a new thing in C plus plus eleven because I remember some text from Herb Sutter about that the compiler isn't allowed to use constness to optimize. Um, and what uh, I'd be wishing for the compiler to use constness for the the question is, is, is this modifying a const object in a new thing in C++11 because of a, a talk that Herb Sutter gave about whether or not the compiler could use um, const to optimize? I don't believe this is a new thing in C++11. My take from Herb's talk was that in C++11, because of the introduction of multitasking, multi, you know, multi-threading, sorry, um, that the, the, the the, what's a good way to put it? The semantics of passing a value by const reference to a routine have changed. It used to say the routine can assume, can, is not going to change this, and it's not, ever, it's not going to change for the life of the function. Now it means the routine's not going to change this. And that defeats a bunch of optimizations because we could have another thread running in, at the same time, that could be changing this object that I'm holding a const reference to. Okay, and so I can't assume in my routine that if I call, say, if, if I have a const reference to a vector, that I call size at the beginning, and then I call size later, that I get the same answer back, which I could do in C03. John, I saw your hand up. Yeah, this modifying a const object thing is it, it's entirely about const cast. If you do a const cast on something that was passed to you with a const pointer, but was initially not a const object, mm -hmm. then, that's, then that's fine. You can go to town on that. But if you const cast something that was originally declared as a const object, because the compiler might put that in wrong. Okay? And so that's why they're saying it's completely undefined behavior what you do, what happens if the object that you're, that you're doing the const cast on was originally declared as, as a const, const object. That's undefined behavior. Yes. Was everybody able to hear that? Or do I need to repeat it? OK. Um, yes, John. Uh, I just want to mention the const cast itself uh, does not cause undefined behavior. You need to modify the object that's being const cast. Yeah, the const ca a const cast does not necessarily, as John said, does not necessarily cause undefined behavior. It merely, it's. If, if the original object that you had, say, a const pointer to or, or a const ref to was not const, if it was originally const, as John said, um, it could be in ROM and, you know, or, or in, a, read only, you know, in a, a, a section of memory that has been marked read only by your memory protection system. Uh, okay. Uh, what, what I want to say is that if your original object is, is const, mm -hmm. Okay, you yeah. Back. Whoops, excuse me. Got it. So what he said was, if you, even if, if, your, if your original object is const, you can still cast the constness away with a const cast. That's, that's defined behavior. But then if you modify it, then it's undefined behavior. Okay, more. Fun, fun one. Negating int min. Okay? Uh, negating, right. You, you take int min minus, let's say for 16 bit ints, minus 32768, and you negate it, what do you get? You don't get 32768, do you? <laughs> um, you get undefined behavior. Um, data races. This is a huge catch all in standard, okay? And sadly, there are, there are not good tools for finding this. Um, I had somebody come up to me yesterday um, after the sessions were over who had been who in one of, one of the sessions in the afternoon that I was not in had become convinced of something that I had said to him many, uh, several months ago. And, and he, he said, you're right. And, he, and this, the comment I had made is, there are no benign data races. There just aren't. <laughs> um, um, mismatch between new and delete. When you, when you call, the second, when you, when you delete something, you need to call the, the delete that matches the new you called. Yes. Um, so it seems like everything up till now has been stuff essentially that, that occurs at compile time or, or you know that, that may not be detectable by static analysis, but still. But 
data races still seem separate. Like it's something that may only occur at runtime, right? Well, so, certainly the question is, is that a lot of these seem to be things that can happen, at, that can be detected or happen at compile time. Um, yes, um, but data races obviously not so much detectable at compile time. Um, and some of these, yeah, um, let me get down here. Also, things that you can't necessarily detect at compile time. There are some things that you can detect, undefined behavior detect at compi compile time, and those are actually the scary ones because as I get on, I'll show you, I'll show you about smart compilers. But, um, but yeah, some of these you cannot detect except at runtime. So then uh, related to that, then you mentioned, uh, and then you might get to this, so, mm -hmm. so we, can, we can push it off a little bit, but uh, you mentioned that if, if it's on un behind behavior, then the, it doesn't matter if it's up till that point, it's programs just undefined now. Right. Uh, and if it's a case where it's something that, that occurs at runtime, mm -hmm. is it, how does that work into that? Um, the question is, so if it's, if it's something that the compiler can detect at compile time, um, then you know every ex execution of the program exhibits undefined behavior. If it's something that can be detected at runtime, is this something where you get good behavior up to that point? And I want you to hang on to that because I have some slides coming that shows show you well, not really. Yes. I think with the last one, memcopy with overlapping buffers, you have to be able to guarantee at time you code the program that that cannot happen because. If you try to compare the pointers, um, interesting comment. If mem copy with overlapping buffers, if you tr if you have to guarantee this at basically at compile time, because with over if you, otherwise you're comparing pointers into different data structures. Um, in interesting idea. Um, specifically, the C standard library specifically has mem move that is designed to handle overlapping buffers. Yes, Jihan. Okay. Okay. So, Chi Hong says that if if they um, it this is again tied into the strict aliasing rules, and if you have two pointers which can. Uh, one type can alias another and, and bytes. Bytes is, can, can pretty much alias everything. So that's, that's how you get around this. Um, last one, or the one up above memcopy. Calling a, a standard library routine, or a library routine, without fulfilling its prerequisites. The, um, uh, the standard, if you read the C++ standard, it says, you know, there's a bunch of, call, bunch of things in there that, you know, library calls. So it's a thousand pages of library calls, right? And they all have a little thing, at the, at, well, I shouldn't say all of them. Many of them have a thing that says, you know, requires. Okay, those are preconditions. If you don't fulfill the preconditions, um, you have no guarantees on what that library call is going to do. I do have a slide for that. Um, okay, here's an example. Yikes! Um, you have foo that does something, right? Okay, doesn't really matter what it does. Uh, we we call new foo, and then later we delete it. Um, so just think about this. Think about, you know, okay, we do this. We, we run four constructors. How many constructors do we get run here? Um, on my system, on my system, I get a really nice behavior. My program crashes with an error message that says, attempting to free a block that wasn't malloced. That's a really, really good answer. Yes? Zero. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. So the comment is none of them because P is an int pointer, not a foo pointer. Ding, ding, ding. Um, but <laughs> modulo bugs in my slides. Um, I want to apologize for the slides. These, these slides, I, yeah, the, the, the slides are, the, the code on the slides, I, I tried to, to to present concepts, um, no, this was this is just typo. Okay, this this was this was not done deliberately, and so they tend to be shrunk down to fit on slides. Um, 
if you, you know, if you have, I will make these slides available. If you have trouble uh, with the code on the slides, contact me and I will give you bigger programs. <laughs> um, okay, atomic lock is free. Um, you pa it passes a, a pointer to a shared pointer. This is a very weird interface, but okay. Requires P shall not be null. If you pass atomic is lock free to, and you pass null there, no guarantees on what, what kind of um, behavior you're going to get. Okay, arithmetic operations. Woohoo! Um, blah, blah blah blah. This is, I think, the last bit of the last wad of standard ease in the presentation. Okay, um, if the math results not mathematically defined or not in the range of representable values for its type, the behavior is undefined. So if you're working with uint 8t and you add 200 plus 200, not excuse me, not uint 8t into 8t, and you add Sorry, we don't even go to 255, do we? You add 100 plus 100, the result is undefined because you can't get to 200. Okay? Um, yeah, notes here, right? Blah, 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 blah. Um, most implementations ignore integer overflows. Um, but it's not actually required. Um, Um, we make use of integer overflows. Sorry, uh, there's a, the there's, okay, let me, let me back up. Um, there is a specific call out in the, um, in the, in the section immediately after this that says that unsigned integers don't behave this way. They, they behave as if you, the arithmetic was done modulo yeah. uint max. So that's not undefined behavior. Yeah. Okay. But signed integers, yeah, we're in LLVM. I'm saying the, the note that we, ignoring integer overflows, we, we, if we can prove that it, it signed integer overflows, then we assume that that can't happen. Yeah, I'll get to that. Okay. He, he said that, what? Well, no. Most implementations ignore integer overflows. That's not wrong. Most is the weasel word here. LLVM. As uh, Michael has pointed out, actually, and I have I have slides about that because that's really the the one of the scary things about undefined behavior is uh, that compilers are getting smarter about undefined behavior and they're using this as as part of their code generation strategy. Um, okay, no wrong answers. Does this print true? Does this print false? Does this print true followed by false, false followed by true? Does it print nothing at all? Does it, you know, does it invoke the nasal, nasal demons? Um, actually, yes, it invokes the nasal de demons. <laughs> um, the, the answer is you have no idea. I mean, it can do a different thing every time you run the program. Um, and you know, from, if you have a model of the, of the machine, the, the low-level machine in your head, you say, yeah, sometimes I read this and I'll get a true, and sometimes I'll read it and get a false, just whatever happens to be in memory, but that's not a good way of looking at it. Um, some compilers, some compilers will look at this and just say, oh, the hell with it. Um, Clang, if you crank up the optimization level, will actually just say false. It won't allocate a variable, it won't do a test, it'll just say false. I mean, you could look at the code, and it just—it actually even looks at this and says, "Oh, this isn't even a format string. I can just call puts," and, and it generates called puts p u t s false new line, and that's the whole—that's all the code it generates. Yes, Mike. Why don't we just fix the standard and have it always uh, initialize variables? <laughs> um, why don't we fix the standard and have it always initialize variables? Because one of one of the um, one of the things that um, that the, the philosophy that C got from C was you don't pay for what you don't use, and so um, initializing variables that you might then go, go ahead and write right over. That's that's work that that doesn't actually do anything for your program. It doesn't make your program better, and it slows it down. So um, I suspect that 
Not speaking for the committee, speaking personally, I suspect that would be a non-starter. Yes? Right, this, the standard does, yeah, says reading from uninitialized variables. It's, it's you know, big, big. Why, uh, if the compiler could, say could? Could. Um, compilers are getting much smarter. Um, static analysis tools are really good at finding this. Um, I, I have used several static analysis tools. I mean, so the question is why can't the compiler complain about this? And some compilers will. Okay, um, and some static analysis tools will, will tell you this. And, and the first time you run a static analysis tool and you have like a 100 line, 100 line um, routine and it says way down here at the bottom, it says you're reading from an uninitialized variable right here. And you look at it and you say, what? And it says you went down here, I took the true branch on this if, and then I took the false branch on this if, and then I took the true branch on this if, and I got to here and nowhere in this flow of control was this variable set? And you say, dang, I like that. <laughs> um, it's really nice when that happens. Um, I would expect to see more of this in compilers in the future because compilers have more resources. They're getting smarter. Um, the, yes. The, the reason is that the compiler cannot always uh, warn you. The compiler, certainly the compiler can't always warn you. Um, some, because. Cannot always, yes. Um, but sometimes, like this, the compiler could. I saw a question down here. Yes? I just wanted to say that I would argue that your argument was probably more valid 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like that it causes so much more problems that you don't have, you, you don't finish my variables, for example, in a voice Mm -hmm. In this case, that these days, when when on, on the stack, you know, to see zero angles, everything is virtually free. I would argue that probably this argument doesn't. Okay. The comment is is that 15 years ago, the argument about efficiency um, was was probably much more valid than it is today because well, machines are bigger and faster, and this this causes whoops this causes a fair amount of problems, and that that may cause more. Um, more problems than, than the gains in efficiency outweigh. But you have to remember that C++ and C run on a wide variety of machines. I mean, one of the most popular machines these days for just hacking around on is a Raspberry Pi, which is not a big machine. Um, and I see people work writing code to go on. Um, where's Michael? Is Michael Cassie here? He was writing C++ code and targeting a machine with like 4K of memory a couple years ago. Um, and so, I mean, it used to be that these were small devices. It's not true anymore. But there's there's always small devices coming in at the bottom of, the, bottom of it. John. So this happened to me on search engines that I worked on just weeks ago, where we had someone who was doing a really bright guy, and he did this optimization, and he squeezed out a few more percent of performance. And, you know, it was a big win. But the code he was working on was really scary. We didn't actually find any leaks, but you know, they had a lot of naked pointers. So mm -hmm. we did this reformat so that we used classes and, and did some stuff and made it, cleaned it up. And suddenly his optimization just disappeared. And so I was like, well, what happened? And we looked at it and we said, oh, it's because when we introduced the classes, we also initialized everything. <laughs> and part of the optimization was that we had, you know, we had these, you know, large amounts of, of index stuff that wasn't used yet and had, didn't have any setting at all, and we filled it in as we went. Right. And and so, you didn't pay for what you didn't yeah. use. And so, Every, could everybody hear it, John? There are, there are situations okay. where, where that little bit of cost can be significant. Not in every situation. I mean, in this class, you know, in this situation, it wouldn't make a difference. Right. But there are times when it is. And once you have the policy that says the compiler always initializes, you can't undo that. Right. So Here, and then it. Uh, just so, Marshall, mm -hmm. could you go ahead and repeat what John said in home for the for the recording, and then, then I'll ask he um, I oh, the okay. guy so guy doing the recording could hear it. He, I, I, oh. I I I checked. Okay. Um, so I, part of part of what I'm hearing is that people should 
crank the warnings up to the highest possible value <laughs> and uh, have warnings as errors set. You know, if, if, you're, if you want, you know, everyone's got to make their own policies, right? right. But, but the way you, you get the compiler to detect this stuff, which is undefined behavior, because it's undefined behavior, the compiler has to let it through. It mm -hmm. still compiles. All it can do is generate warnings. So, um, so the comment was that, uh, that the suggestion is, is to crank the warning level on your compiler way up, compile warnings as, as errors, and, and hope that the compiler can catch some of these. And, uh, and in general, that's a policy that, that I favor. It's not always practical, um, especially when you're dealing with third-party libraries and so on that you don't have a lot of control over. Um, I have a couple slides at the end of it as end of the talk about other tools that you can use to detect undefined behavior as well. Ed, and then Michael, I think, in the actually, back. <clears throat> actually, I think that I, my comment, you covered it. In my company, all the developers use debug builds. We use Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. We use debug builds. And we get the thing working, 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 right? And then we release it as a release build. And then just last week, I had an issue with an uninitialized variable, and popping the the uh, level of the uh, optimizations up, it just exposed. All of a sudden, the behavior is flipping back and forth. Right. It's actually an uninitialized rule. Yeah, that's the that's the thing. Is as Ed said, is is as he went from a debug build to a release build, and you know, up the level of optimization that. The behavior changed because he had an uninitialized boolean um, somewhere, and yes, that's that's exactly the kind of things that you can see with um, with undefined behavior. The really insidious ones is, are you get a new version of the compiler and you build with the new version of the compiler, and your program behaves differently, and you say, "Rasa frasa, rum 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 rum, stupid compiler vendors can't even ship a compiler that works." <laughs> Um, Michael, did you have your hand up back there, or were you just stretching? <laughs> Both. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I don't want to take this too far field, because I'm feeling that it might take us away from your the talk here about undefined behavior. But um, my feeling is no defaults, um, because some people mentioned performance, but also um, you don't know um, no correct choices on the right defaults. Um, no one really, and here, here it might be simple and obvious. But when, you, when you're taking some other big types, you don't really know, what, is it one, is it zero? They're all potentially valid. And, and no matter what you pick, will, con will, will, co will, will contradict with somebody's, uh, somebody's choice. And then finally, um, most compilers, my compiler um, does have this, where I can inject, uh, where I can inject at compile time a dead, a dead pattern that I'm looking for um, so that I can definitively know that that is, that is really, mm -hmm. really undefi unde undefined. Or uh, unlike, very. As opposed to one that I accidentally initialized um, incorrectly. Okay, so Michael's, most have Michael's comment was that um, in this case, it's probably reasonably easy to, to figure out what, what, a, what you can uh, default initialize this to. Um, but in this, you still have to choose true or false. But um, if the compiler does it, you know, it, it have to be, have to have a value, default value for pretty much every type. Um, he also mentioned that many compilers have the ability to um, initialize memory to some, some set pattern. Um, I think that, um, you know, like dead beef or something like that, or CD, you know, anyway. Um, there's the, and that is easy to inspect to say, oh, well, look, that pattern, I didn't write that pattern there. That's, that's an uninitialized data pattern. Yes? Yeah, even going beyond, even if you knew what the default should be for every type, you write code like this and the compiler gets rid of your undefined behavior by defaulting it, it's still bad code. It's still I mean, bad, it makes, yes. All they've done is hide the undefined behavior and you're in a worse situation. Well, um, so, yeah, so the, the comment was, you know, if, if, if the compiler defaults this to something, basically it, it's gotten rid of the undefined behavior by, by choosing a behavior for you which may or may not be what you want. Is that a better way to put it? That's and right. it, and well, that it's still it's bad just, code. It's still bad code. Okay, um, how about one more question and then we'll move on because I've got another 20 slides and we're 45 minutes into a talk. Yes? So, if it doesn't derail, uh -huh. um, for this and other things of similar nature, why is this undefined rather than unspecified? 
Um, undefined because you're you're reading from an uninitialized no, variable. I understand. Okay. That is undefined. Why is why is standard? Why does that? Why does standard say that un, un, that uninitialized reads are undefined? It seems rational to expect that it would be merely unspecified. You get some things, but who knows? Um, hang on to that. We'll, we'll, it has to do with compiler engineers. Okay. Ding. Why do we do this? Okay. Um, gives the compiler leeway, gives the compiler freedom to choose how to generate code. And um, by, uh, by assuming that there's no undefined behavior in your program, the compiler can generate simpler, faster, smaller code. Um, this is the same kind of thing that, that we inherited from C about array indexing, right? You say bracket three. There's no check. The, the code, there's, the compiler doesn't generate checks to make sure the, the, array, the array has three or more elements in it, more than three elements in it, excuse me. Um, it just says, oh, third element. Um, you know, why is this important? Um, compilers know about know about language semantics. Um, and they take advantage of it. Um, the standard basically, by placing no requirements on the, on the behavior of programs that contain undefined behavior, it's perfectly legal for a compiler to transform a program that exhibits undefined behavior into any other program. Because there are no wrong answers. Um, and why is this important to compiler writers? Um, how many people here work on code generation for compilers? Yeah, you. <laughs> Gabby. So Gabby and Michael. Um, you know, you work on the back end of GCC and you come and you say, look, I sped up this set of benchmarks by 1%. And everybody says, really? That's yesterday. And they say, that's wonderful. That's super. What have you done for me today? Um, compiler, write, compiler code generator people, they live and die on performance and code size. And it's this never-ending slog. What have you done for me? Yeah, that was yesterday. What have you done for me today? Um, you know, my company, we make firmware, you know, chips and firmware that go in phones. And one of the things that, um, that uh, we have is we have a space budget in the ROM for you know, the code that runs the broadband chips in your phone. It's x number of bytes. Actually, these days, it's x number of megabytes, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so that's how much space there is in the ROM for this code. Okay? Somebody says, well, I need this new feature. Okay, well, um, we're already at budget, space budget. So do you want to take something else out? No. Okay, we can refactor the code to make it, you know, to make it more efficient space-wise. But the other thing they do is they go to the compiler, vendors, uh, compiler writers and say, can you, can you like, generate smaller code, please? And there's this constant pressure for smaller or faster, or usually both, by preference. Um, and this is one of the ways that, the compi that compilers j get that size and speed advantage. And you know, GCC, LLVM, you know, there are people every day out there running the same benchmarks on these two and looking at the difference and making choices as to which compiler to use based on the results of these benchmarks. Oh, look, this test, L of M is 7% faster than GCC. Wow, what are those GCC people doing? Man, they're laggards. Oh, on this test, GCC is 12% faster than, than L of M. And this is really important to people who choose which compiler to use and people who write compilers because, well, they want their compilers to get used. Um, You've got to remember that the compiler is an expert in the language semantics. Okay? You think you know that you know, the, the com people who write the compilers, they have embedded that, the, the knowledge of the language semantics into their code generation, into the compilers. Yes, Gabby? Well, two comments. The first thing is that um, you know, back in the old days, the idea was to trust the programmer. So the program you get and you trust that the programmer was smart and competent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Concerning, you know, the point you made earlier about you know, speed. Internally, my employer wouldn't take 
anything that is below, you know, if you more than 3%, no, it's not going in. <laughs> OK. So uh, Gabby's comment was, you know, in the past, the, the assumption was that the programmer knew what they were doing. That, you know, that the programmer was, um, was what's competent was, was expressing himself in terms of code correctly. He also commented that there's, um, that there's a, a threshold for, for improvements. You know, little tiny improvements tend not to get invented. And people look for big improvements. You know, less than 2%, he said, yeah, no, nah, it's not worth doing. Although I, I, the people I work with, it's like, you know, a percent and a half, it's not that important. But when you put four of them together, suddenly you're at like 7%. And all of a sudden, everybody says, ooh. So I saw another hand back here. No? OK. Um, anyway, um, John Reger at the University of Utah has been doing a lot of work about undefined behavior, specifically about integer stuff, but a lot about undefined behavior. And um, he has written a package called the Integer Overflow Checker. Um, but he has come up with this taxonomy of, um, of undefined behavior for talking about routines. Um, type 1, no matter what your inputs, no undefined er error. This is the kind of routines we should all strive to write. Um, type 3, undefined behavior every time, no matter what the inputs. Here's an example. Okay, frankly, these are uninteresting. These, people don't write these very much. And if they do, they tend to fix them pretty quickly because um, they find that they're unreliable. Um, type 2, it gives you undefined behavior for some subset of all possible inputs. These are the, the most common ones. Okay? These are the ones that people write by accident. Um, here's an example. Okay, this is taken from some code I reviewed at work several years ago. Um, the names have been changed to protect the guilty. Um, takes an integer pointer. It logs this to say you know, how we got called. We see if it's <coughs> null. If, if it's null, then we malloc it, do some stuff, and return it. OK. Um, so this is a type 2 routine. If, if the pointer that is passed in is not null, there's no undefined behavior here. OK? But if the pointer that's passed in is null, this call to this log routine will indirect it. And thus invoke undefined behavior. This was, bad, this, this was very common uh, throughout the code base I was looking at because it, this was an old code that uh, ran on phones many years ago that didn't have memory protection. And so indirecting from null, you know, there was no memory protection, so it didn't get trapped or anything. You just read from location zero, and you got a value. It wasn't the value you expected, but you got a value. So, um, so let's think about this from the point of a view of a compiler. So if, if p is not null, this branch never gets taken, does it? If, uh, if p is null, I've got undefined behavior here. And there are no wrong answers. Um, do I really need to generate this code? Really? No. <laughs> um, no, I don't. And um, GCC at O2 and above will not generate this code. We'll, we'll basically elide this entire block of code. It will not appear in your object file anywhere. Because of the call to log, yes. Exactly. Um, Sun CC does this. Microsoft Visual C++ does this. Clang does this. Lots of compilers do this. Okay, this it just showed up for the first time, I think, in like GCC 4.2 or something. Like this. this is not a new optimization. Okay, you're a compiler vendor, right? People people say, you know, what have you done for me today? You, you say, look, smaller code, faster code. It runs faster. It's every bit as correct as 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 it would be if I generated this code. Okay? I've taken, I've taken a program that, that exhibits undefined behavior in some circumstances, 
and change the behavior of the program in those circumstances. In the cases where the, this, there was no undefined behavior here, the program behaves identically. It's only in the case where there was undefined behavior, this program behaves differently. That's a perfectly legal transformation. Any questions about this? No, I was just going to comment it's especially fun when that log statement is protected by a macro that you only use the debug mode. Yes, <laughs> that's also fun. Um, and you know, the, the history of this code, of course, is that when this was originally written, the log wasn't there. And there was no undefined behavior. And then sometime later, um, the proverbial, you know, the, the mythical intern who is the cause of all of everybody's problems in every code base, right, was given a task to, to add logging to, to this code base. And they went through and did this. And actually, in the original code, this was, you know, if def q debug or something like that, right? So in debug builds, undefined, undefined behavior. In non debug builds, it's fine, but the, you know what the thing is? Is the code generator was completely different, and that makes it really hard to test. Um, but on the other hand, if I would have said log something uh, p equal equal null or something like that greater than, then that would not be undefined. That would not be undefined as long as you don't indirect this in in the case that it's null. Then it's not undefined. The question was. If, if replace this with like some ternary operator, it says p equals null question mark um, zero colon star p, no problem. So, uh, all right, given that, uh -huh. I mean, the compiler is actually smart enough to detect that that's an undefined behavior if one branch of the ter I mean, if. Yes. That's pretty sophisticated. Yes. It's the question was is the compiler actually smart enough to detect that this is undefined behavior? In the case where this this is null, when one 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 set of one branch of the you know, potential execution paths, and the answer is yes. And it's not just the compiler; it's pretty much every compiler these days is smart enough to do that. Gabby, so it's actually very simple because the compiler is looking for undefined behavior. The compiler is looking for assertions that things are okay. So when you do pointer, the assertion there is that the pointer is not null. So you could just as well have put assert p null, not equal, not pointer. And you have the same effect. Yeah, so what Gabby said was that, that the compiler is not actually generating a whole set of, of possible different execution paths, but it's reasoning about this code. And it looks at this code and it says, oh, um, I'm indirecting P here. So what do I know? I know, thank you. I know that either P is not null or I have undefined behavior. Okay? If I have undefined behavior, I don't really care. Okay? Correctness is, is easy. I can do pretty much anything. So I'm just going to believe that P is not null from now on. I, get, I, I mark in my, in my little knowledge base that P is not null from here on. And then I'd say, oh, well, this is a test for p is null. This always evaluates to false. This, this gets changed to if false. And then this is unreachable code, and I can delete it. Is that a good description? OK. Another example. OK. You can this, is, this is a complete one. You can take this back and try it on your computer. OK. This is all C, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> yes, you do see C++. Anyway, um, start with a value, and then every time through the loop, we add this value to itself, and we print out what the value is, and we do this as long as i is greater than 0. Um, if you run this with GCC, it will print out this number, then, then 2, whatever, then 4, whatever, then 8, whatever, and exit. Except it will print, won't print the hex values. It will print decimal values. And you say, that's great. And then try it with, um, with like, 0, 02. And it will print 100, you know, 1, da-da-da, 2, da-da-da, 4, da-da-da, 8, da-da-da, 0, 
zero, 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 forever. It will print, it will print zero as long as you're willing to let it run. So what has happened here? Well, the optimizer has looked at this code and has done some reasoning about it. It says, hmm, that's a positive number. It's a positive sign number. Every time I through this, I'm adding a positive number to itself. That's going to be a positive number or undefined behavior. And well, I don't really care. And then at the end of the loop, I'm testing to see if it's a positive number. But you know what? I just proved to my satisfaction that it's always a positive number. So I don't really have to actually test this thing. I just go back and do it again. And yes, it does. Um, because, you know, a d oh, signed integer overflow is undefined behavior. Um, some machines, you know, when this overflows, you know, they issue a hardware trap and your program gets killed. Um, which is also undefined behavior. Any questions about this? Okay, why do we care about undefined behavior? Because it's surprisingly easy to write code that has undefined behavior. Um, this link here is to a, um, a talk about, a, a discussion about a particular bug in the Google portable native client runtime where somebody did a, what they thought was a simple refactoring of some code and, in, and um, introduced some undefined behavior, introduced a shift left of 32 uh, into a, um, of an int, of a 32-bit integer. And basically this, this defeated a security test in the, um, a security check in the portable native client runtime. Oops. Um, undefined behavior, you, code exhibiting undefined behavior may work for a while, may work, appear to work just fine for a while, and then suddenly stop working. Break when, yeah, when you change the optimization level, when you go from a debug build to a release build, when you switch to a new version of the compiler. God, those LLVM guys, they're so stupid. I went from 3.3 to 3.4 and all my code broke. What have they done? Or GCC 4.9 or whatever, or Visual Studio 2010 to 2012 or 13. Um, this is, you know, it's really easy to shoot the messenger here, okay? You get a new compiler. Nothing has changed in your code. You just built with a new compiler and now it doesn't work. It's got to be the compiler, right? Not always. Um, okay, I know lots of people who work on compilers. There's people in this room who work on compilers. They'd be the last to tell you that compilers have no bugs. That's just silly. But an awful lot of the time, it's not the compiler. Um, this is what the stack people call optimization unstable code. This is code that behaves differently at different optimization levels, different compilers, and so on. And you've got to remember, the non-defined behavior, there's no wrong answers. The code's not incorrect. I mean, the code is not behaving incorrectly. It's giving you different answers. They may not be the answers you want, but it's because the undefined your behavior, you're seeing the results of undefined behavior. Um, this is the first time I mentioned the stack people. I'll mention them some more. Um, undefined behavior shows up in tricky code. Okay, frequently code that's trying to do security checks and things like that. Um, this is a fascinating discussion. Um, this is an old, old, this is like a nine year old bug report in GCC. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, it was um, basically an optimization that was introduced into a really old version of GCC where, where it did something similar to this. Okay, it optimized out tests when it, when it could prove that either the, the, be, the behavior was undefined or the result was always true. People got seriously bent out of shape. Um, one of the ones was like, I demand that you revert this immediately. People are going to die because you optimized away my security checks. <laughs> I don't care what the standard says. You can't do this. Um, and it it's, goes on and on and on. I mean, you could, it's, it's, it's a very entertaining half hour. <laughs> uh, I will make the slides available, okay? 
these slides available on you know the the, the C plus plus now GitHub repo. So I mean you're welcome to to write this down, but um, if you don't, you know you can check this out later. Um, Stack. I'll, let's talk about Stack. Stack is a, a grad school grad student project out of MIT. Um, their goal is to find what they call optimization unstable code, code that behaves differently under different levels of optimization, usually because it contains undefined behavior. And what they do, interestingly, it's, it's based on, on LLVM, and what they do is basically they, they compile code at, at low optimization and a high optimization, and then, and it's, it's a, um, and then examine the internal data structures of the, uh, the LLVM back end to say, Hey, a whole chunk of code just disappeared here. Why did that happen? How, why did the optimizer decide that it could just get rid of this? And then they go look and looking for uh, undefined code, there. undefined behavior, excuse me. Um, and they wrote a paper, and I have a link at, at the end to this paper. It's a very fascinating paper, both because of the technology behind it, how they went and did it, but also the reactions to people that they talked to. They, uh, they, they ran this against a bunch of things, uh, a bunch of code um, in Postgres. And the Postgres developers were, had a mix of reactions. Some of their reactions were, ooh, yeah, wow. That's a, that's a nasty bug. Thank you for pointing it to our attention. We'll fix that. And some of them were, no, that's the compiler being stupid. Um, OK, blaming the compiler is very, very satisfying. <laughs> but you know what? You still have to ship the output of the compiler to users, and, and saying the compiler is being stupid doesn't really help you help your users. Um, anyway, okay, um, checks are hard to write. This is an example from the Apple Secure Coding Guidelines from a couple of months ago. Um, Bruce Dawson was all over this. Um, basically, okay, fine, we. Uh, you know, this is actually the second revision of this, okay? Um, multiply two numbers together. It doesn't actually say here, but I'm pretty sure they're ints. Multiply two numbers together, and then we're going to check and see if n is greater than zero, m is greater than zero, and size max, da da da, is n is greater than m, then, then we can allocate this space, okay? The problem with this is it's too late. You know, the test here, the, the uh, integer overflow, the undefined behavior, it's already happened. No. Size t is uh, unsigned integer. You but, but you're multiplying two ints. The fact that you're assigning it to a size t is a red herring. It's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the operation. Well, if they're ints. If you have yeah, to, yeah. You, if, you, you, if you cast these to size t, then there's no undefined behavior here. Yeah, the fact that this assigning to a size t is, is irrelevant um, because you're, you're, you're multiplying two integers here. Um, and I, the way I see, I, I talk about this is kind of, um, we, all, we all know about the dangers of stir copy, right? You, you can't really use stir copy in a safe way. You have to pretty much pre-flight it every single time to see if your buffer is big enough to hold the source. Okay? You cannot call stir copy and then check to see if the buffer overflow has occurred. It doesn't really work that way. It's too late. Um, this is a similar circumstance. You can't actually do something and check, then check to see if undefined behavior has happened because the damage has already been done. In this case, though, the damage didn't happen at runtime. The damage happened at compile time, and the damage occurred. The damage occurred in the compiler's internal data structures, the, the things that the compiler uses to reason about your code and to generate code. Okay. Um, the compiler kind of gets can kind of assume that this is true after this multiplication, because if it isn't true, you know, undefined behavior has happened. This last test here. Um, so this slide was my attempt to talk about aliasing, and Chi Hong's going to giggle, but that's okay. Um, but basically, so we have, you know, functions. We have two unrelated types, but you know, Foo has 
pretty much the same layout as the start of bar. And I see this a lot. Actually, there's a bug in libc++ about this. Um, and so we, we create a foo, and we create a bar pointer that points to, to f. And we write through that pointer, and then we try to print it out. Um, the compiler can reason about this and say, you know, bar, bar. A bar pointer, you have a bar, a point, a read to, a write to a structure of type bar and a read from a structure of type foo. They're not related classes. One's not a subclass of each other. The compiler can assume that this write doesn't affect f. And it can reorder these. <laughs> Okay, if that generates smaller or faster code. And you get not the answer you were expecting. <laughs> you, this could print three. Um, I, have a, I have a much better example in the libc++ code base, but it doesn't even come close to fitting on a slide. That C style cast there is evil. Yes. Why would anybody do this C style? <laughs> but but you know what? Reinterpret cast doesn't really help you here. No, I mean I do a dynamic cast, a little end up happening. It'll it fail. Will, yeah. Well, our P will be a, a, a zero. Yes. And on the next line, I say if P. Right. If you do a dynamic cast, dynamic cast helps you here. But there are people. Okay. That's helping. That is, that is helping. But the, the, the point is, is that, that the compiler can reason that, you know, I, I, see a, I see a write to one of these and a read to one of these, and they're different types, they're unrelated types, and so it can assume that they're independent. Okay? It's an old C style coding thing of taking different structure definitions and, and pretending that they overlay in memory, and that, right. you know, it's a poor man's union. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. well, I, think in, I think in C, it, I think if bar, if, if foo is the first member of bar, I think that's actually part of the I think it's actually legal. Um, the, the comment is in C, if, if, if the first member of bar, whoops, a first member of bar is actually a foo, then it's legal. And I believe that is. Sure, it's even in C++ yeah. it's legal because you're, you rec not, you know, you could make a foo pointer. But in any case, um, here, let's, um, don't be this guy. <laughs> you know, you think you're solid, you think you're good, <laughs> and you're, <coughs> I'll bet that's cold. Anyway, I, I saw that, uh, I, I saw that a couple months ago, and I, and I kind of said, oh, that's funny, and then I was preparing this talk, and it's like, oh, yeah. That's, that's a good way, you know, people, this is how people think about their code sometimes. And, and, it's, and undefined behavior has this way of just carving everything out underneath. And, it, and suddenly, you know, you're, you're, you're laying there. He didn't even roll into the water, so he got off lucky. Um, yes. Oh, he was first? Okay. Are there reasons, good reasons, to put undefined behavior on your program? And I'm thinking... Like processors, they'll do predictive look ahead. They'll do some calculation and then throw it all away later. And in your code, you might want to start some calculation with numbers that may overflow, may be <coughs> undefined, and then throw it away because you've calculated that it's not. Um, so the the question is: Is it is there a reason to put undefined behavior in your program? And and they talked about predict performance reasons, but predict speculative execution kind yeah. of thing. And I think the answer is no. And the answer is no is because um, the compiler won't do what you expect it to do. The compiler will make assumptions that basically say, you know, this undefined behavior could never happen and generate code based on those kind of assumptions. Well, it depends on the undefined. You know, if it's a calculation where it's going to overflow, but you're going to throw it away because or you start two calculations and you're going to pick one of them. Um, I would be... The, so the comment was maybe you start two two calculations and one of them might garbage. is garbage, um, and then you pick one of them. I I would be very leery about that because um, there's no wrong answers. You know that the compiler will. You, you remember this example, right? The compiler just elided elided a whole pile of your of code because it said you know. 
if it's undefined behavior, I don't need to actually do this. If it's undefined behavior, you know, and, and you won't get the answers you expect. If you're lucky, you won't get the answers you expect. If you're unlucky, you will get the answers you expect and you'll be good for a while. But um, in general, uh, you don't really want undefined behavior in your code. Um, you were next. And then, and then John, and then you. We understand that we find the behavior is needed uh, to take care of uh, uh, the best uh, machine could give us. But uh, what the language could do mm -hmm. in order to uh, avoid that each time we change the list of the compiler mm -hmm. or uh, take a new compiler, we uh, have less risk to. Uh, Right. Oh, so in, in this undefined behavior that was hidden by the previous one. Okay. So uh, let me try to summarize this, and you can tell me where I got it wrong. Um, you know, the the big problem is you know about undefined behavior is you you upgrade your compiler, you um, you switch to a different compiler, and suddenly things stop working because you had undefined behavior, um, and. Um, you want a way to actually find it e more easily and, and eradicate it from your from your code base, or maybe I'm misinterpreting what you said completely. Oh, I, I see that the, the, the compiler is able mm -hmm. to detect sometimes okay. undefined behavior because it is in it, mm -hmm. but to be uh, more uh, to optimize. Then, uh, this is a quality of implementation, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I am wondering if uh, uh, we could, on, at the language level, state that this kind of detections are a state of the art and need to be detected by any compiler in order to be conformant. Okay, to so. The so wondering if there's there's ways to specify, you know, to to require that the compilers or even as a quality of impl uh, QOI, a quality of implementation thing, have compilers warn about when they detect undefined behavior, or uh, warn or error. Okay, um, but but let's look at this this example. Go back to this example. Okay, if you never call this with null, there's no undefined behavior here. I mean, this, if you never pass null to this, there's no undefined behavior here. And there's nothing for the compiler. I mean, OK, the compiler could warn that, that, that this code may never get imp executed. Um, but so there's, there's not any undefined behavior here. It's potentially. Yes. No, if you, if, you, if, you, if you don't call it with null, you can remove this part of the function, this from if p, this if block. But yes. Um, but yeah, um, there are tools coming. There are some tools uh, available, and there are other tools coming. I'll talk about them I mean, that help you find undefined behavior. Um, anyway. This cannot be an error because uh, maybe you don't call the function. Okay, it could, if you don't call it, there's no problem. Um, was, who was next? John. John was next, and then you. Okay. So I think what, what, what David suggested earlier about possibly using undefined behavior to trigger some some behavior that we'd like to see is really the trap of what I think this talk is about, which is to say some some programmers are smart. So they say, well, I know the standard doesn't actually guarantee this, but I know what my platform will do in this case. And and I'm just going to throw the result away anyway, or whatever the reason is. That I know that it doesn't guarantee what I might expect, but I don't need that in this situation, so I'm just going to ignore it. And I think the whole trap is that compiler writers are now figuring out that they can generate tighter code in the situation where they just assume undefined behavior never happens. Right. So what's happening is you've just given the compiler writer the license to generate any code at all. There is no way that you can anticipate and say, well, this undefined behavior is actually a benefit to me in some way. Actually, the, the, only, the only case where you can do that is if you, if you fix your platform which means a single compiler forever at a single optimization level. Um, and that may be a, a, a valid uh, thing to do in the very short term, but how many people out there are still using GCC 4.1? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4? 4.4
<laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, right here, and then Ed. And how are we doing here? We got. Okay, we got. I got like eight more slides, and and it's eight more minutes. So I think a practical example for the entire space when you do mechanical mechanism, you don't have CPU or an ionic CPU, then you have. 8, 10, 16, however many data that you do the same operation, mm -hmm. and then sometimes you, don't, you, you, know, you only use just some part of it, and you don't want to build, initialize the rest of it, right? And in GPUs, this is, a, this is probably a, a bigger in, impact when you, when you have really, really wide. OK. It, um, the comment was about that, the, that uh, Dave's example may be more, more applicable for um, GPU programming where you have you know many cores doing very similar stuff and you use some of the results but the problem is is that if the the, the pieces that that rely on undefined you know that invoke undefined behavior if you're going to you can't rely on those answers right yes. so why are you even doing that work you're going to throw that work away it's cheaper to, to do the work than to not do the work. No, no, no. Imagine that you, let's say, you're only calculating 5. Uh -huh. Since your uh, data path is 16 wide, mm -hmm. you just do for the 5 and don't care about the rest. That's the cheapest way to do it. <sighs> yeah, I, you know, you're putting an awful lot of trust in, in that your compiler is not smart enough to figure that out. <laughs> That the, the the question the comment was if you if you're you're doing five calculations but your your GPU is sixteen cores and it's just easy to do sixteen of them and then just take five, and my comment is you're 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 putting a lot of trust in that your compiler is not smart enough to notice that there's undefined behavior and and generate code based on that. Beeman. Uh, the way I think of it is that undefined behavior destroys your ability to reason about your and that's that's a disaster. It's just, and there are other things you can do to destroy your <laughs> right. ability to reason about a program. And Dave Abrahams and others are smarter than I am. Have long for years pointed out that that's just a, it's just a disaster when you can't make sensible right inferences. Yeah. Uh, so Beeman's comment is that undefined that, that undefined behavior destroys your ability to, to reason about your program, and that this is a really bad thing. That if you can't if you can't make inferences about how your program works, you know you're you're in a in a in a world of hurt already. Are yes. There, uh, who have chosen uh, to take a, a model of giving you a way to say you know pass a flag maybe that says assume that you know, please make integer overflow, for example, defined. Maybe unspecified, but, but defined. Sure. So yeah, it's, you know, doing things crazy. Um, I don't mind that it's slower. So there, the question was, is, are there compiler vendors that have, have let you do things that, um, let, you know, with a flag or something that make integer overflow defined or, you know, give them, give them a particular behavior? And yes, there are. Um, um, I can't remember what the flag is in Clang. There is one, and there's one in GC. What? G G G it's probably the same flag in both of them. Yes. Trap V, I think it is. Wrap, wrap V. Okay. Um, yes. And you know, some architectures, like I mentioned, they just issue a trap instruction and and knock and kill your program dead. Um, Chandler. Just a comment about that. Um, if you if you use these flags, be aware that you've moved to a far less well tested state of your compiler. Uh -huh. <laughs> you may get to keep the broken pieces. So the Chandler's comment was if you use these flags, then um, then be aware that you've you've you put the compiler in a much less well tested state. This is this is not something that uh, that gets run all the time. Yes, Gabby. Ten years ago I was at Mm -hmm. You know, overflow the sign. And it turns out that there are a lot of good programs that you want to keep running at fast speed that is just slow down. And the conclusion was this is not something you want to put on the front. 
Okay, um, I got a few more slides to run through and then we'll just do questions until the end. We only got like two minutes. Um, what can you do about this? Um, be aware. Be aware of undefined behavior. If you're doing something tricky, think about undefined behavior. Is it, am I invoking the nasal demons here? Um, if you can, build your compiler, you know, your code with several compilers and different optimization levels. Um, you can't check for undefined behavior after it's happened. <laughs> okay, I talked about this earlier. If you write this code, will this overflow int a, a plus 100 less than a? Your compiler will, will, may, depending on your settings, depending on how smart your compiler, will optimize it down to that. <laughs> um, you should write something like this. This is all defined behavior. And it does what you want as opposed to return false. Um, tools. Tools are starting to appear. Um, Clang has f sanitize equals undefined. It's a compiler pass and a custom runtime. It does not detect undefined behavior at compile time. It detects it at runtime. You build stuff. Um, you build your program with these settings and then you run your test suite. And it will flag undefined behavior as it happens. This is, this is the bomb. This is such a wonderful thing. Um, John Rager has an integer overflow checker program. This is part of Clang 3.4 as well. F sanitize, F sanitize equals integer. We'll, we'll warn you about these. Um, uh, last summer, um, there's this program called Stack. Um, I have a link to the paper. Um, it's the, the code is still very much a work in progress, but um, if you're willing to baby it, you can get some really good results out of it. Um, so, quick quiz. Think like a compiler. How would you optimize this code? Anybody want to answer this? You would just throw everything away. Well, everything except the last line. No, you could not uh, potentially end up on. Yeah, but what if P is not? Dark P is so? undefined? So? So? It, so it's implied that P is not null, and so? therefore the other choice is undefined oh, behavior, oh, so the right, only thing left right. is to assign 4 into it. Yeah, you, oh, you're right. you, 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 you indirect it here, you read from it here, <coughs> which you say, okay, either it's null, either it's not null, or I'm in undefined behavior land. Fine. I check to see if it's null, but you know what? I already, I've already decided it's not null, so we can get rid of this. And then, oh, well, look, you know, this, this value isn't ever used, so I don't need to actually do that. Um, anyway, questions, we'll, yeah, references. Um, John Reger's blog, lots of stuff here. Um, this is the stack paper right here. Um, user manual for Clang and, uh, and undefined behavior sanitizer. Um, the LLVM blog has a three-part thing about what every C programmer should know about undefined behavior. Um, more things from John Rigger. And um, a, an, AC, a, a, an ACCU presentation from last year about un, unspecified undefined behavior. This is a really interesting talk if you're interested in code generation because basically he takes a bunch of code samples and then run and then compiles them with a bunch of different compilers and then examines the object code. Okay, uh, we have, ooh, we are out of time. Um, I will be quite happy to answer questions, but let's do it outside. Okay, we're on break for a half an hour. Thank you. <laughs>